If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Today is Respect Life Sunday, and I'm going to talk about the victim paradox. The victim paradox. Our culture's changed. It always seems to change, doesn't it? But uh, somebody had told me one time that Pastor Jamie preached a sermon on the slight shift in life. How we're supposed to go a clear, straight direction toward God, but sometimes we have a slight shift that we don't really recognize at first, but it takes a while down the road to realize how far off the path you are. And I think that's where our culture has come to, is we've had a subtle shift that's growing more dramatic over time. Our governmental system and personal relationships used to be based on a faith and understanding and hope and in the individual that you gave people the benefit of the doubt, that you had faith in other individuals, that you had a hope that they had a perspective on this world that was healthy. It used to be that a person was innocent until proven guilty. But because of the erosion of personal ethics, morality, accountability on a personal level and a governmental level, we've grown skeptical and faithless in our fellow man. Now, any time an accusation is made about a person for life, they're labeled without evidence or proof. Now, here's the part of the message where you think, oh, I know that scenario. There's lots of circumstances and scenarios that we can plug into. The most recent being the whole Supreme Court nomination. But you can think of presidential nominations. You can look at other court proceedings. You can look at allegations through the different denominations and churches about, about different people, or even your own experience, where someone has said something about you, and everybody assumed that you were guilty without any evidence, right? We have no faith in one another. We have no hope in each other. We just assume the worst of one another. Our culture seems to be more polarized, polarized than never before. So you only have to hold to one extreme belief or another. And there is no middle, right? There, there's, we, don't, we don't believe there's a middle, and we don't allow anybody else to be in the middle. If they have certain viewpoints, we automatically think that they're extremists. And so we are segregated by our strong beliefs so much so that we can't even have a dialogue or discussion with somebody that has a different perspective Because that lack of trust and faith is eroded. And that is not how things should be. We should be able to communicate with people that have different perspectives and different beliefs without fighting. In this culture, though, the victim rules. The victim rules. It's come to a place where if you claim to be a victim, then people cannot question you. And immediately, people attack the accused perpetrator. Don't get me wrong. I'm so thankful that we live in a day and in a culture where people are speaking up and standing out and saying, I've been harmed. I've been wounded. This is wrong. People need to be held accountable. I am so thankful for that. Aren't you? It's a great time for that to be occurring, that that finally these, these shameful, awful atrocities are being exposed to the light. It's only when things are exposed that sin can be dealt with. But the problem is this assumption without facts, without data, because of the polarized perspective. But it seems like everyone finds a way to be a victim, explaining why they can't change and move forward because of what's been done to them in the past. And because of that, there's no growth in grace. There's no freedom with forgiveness. And so those who are considered the most victimized are given a free pass in life. Oh, no, you can't blame them for what they say. You can't fault them for what they do. You don't know what happened in their life. They've been through so much, they get a free pass. They can't be held accountable. No, 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 no. And so we live in a culture where everybody says they're the victim. And the greatest victim wins. Now, this is a very tricky message you haven't caught on to that yet to say anything negative about a person who considers themselves a victim is a no-no because if you don't agree with them you're told that you're not sympathetic 
that you don't care and you're automatically grouped in with the person that, acu- that, that perpetrated whatever act was against them. Okay? The polarized effect. If you're not completely with me, then you're completely against me. Today I'm going to show you what God thinks about the victims of the world. And I'm going to show you what he thinks of the perpetrators of the world, the abusers, the ones that have hurt others. And we're going to talk about how we as Christians need to approach these issues in our culture. Because we just don't know sometimes. How do we navigate in this world? None of us want to be labeled one way or the other. So what do we do? Today is Respect Life Sunday. You know, there's three specific times a year where we focus on the importance of life. Two of them often deal with the right to life issue with abortion. One of them specifically is targeting human trafficking. And so there is a focus here. We do, as a church, and have historically always spoken up for the unborn because they're the least and most marginalized individuals in society. They literally have no voice or representation because before they even get outside of the safe nest of their mother's womb, their life is ripped from them. And so the first thing I want to share you, with you this morning is that life is the most basic of human rights. Life is the most basic of human rights. We talk about all the different rights that we have as human beings. We build a tower of our life. If the foundation for your rights is not the right to life, then every other part of your tower has a bad foundation. You start there and you don't move from there. The right to live, the right to exist, is a God-given basic human right that cannot be shaken and should not be compromised. How do we know this? Scripture. Scripture shows us this. Scripture shows us in multiple places, one being in Isaiah, that God opens and shuts the womb. Even in my own life, when my wife and I were ready to have children or thought we were ready to have children, we suffered through infertility. We went to experts and doctors and took drugs and everything else to try to help us get pregnant. But it was, as I've shared my testimony with you, it was at God's timing that my firstborn was born. And he did it in such an obvious way that I would always remember it because she was born on August 8th of 2008 at 8.08 p.m. My time, not your time. And then when Ava came along, we were like, here, here's another kid for you. That's how it came about. But when you read scripture and you study it, we worry about birth control and this and that. And we try to control our lives. Scripture is clear. God opens and shuts the womb. Read Genesis and see how many of the early patriarchs, their spouses were barren and it happened in God's timing. I thought I could strong arm God into giving me children when it was the right time. You cannot do that with God. And so that needs to be our perspective, especially when you know you think you're walking with God and you're right family and you look around and you think, How are they getting pregnant? They don't even want to be pregnant. How are they having children? Well, Scripture also tells us that we're persons and individuals before conception. That God knows us before we're born. That should be on the next Scripture. Let's go to the next slide there. Um, Yeah, the next slide there. Uh, Jeremiah 1.5, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. So you are a person even before conception in God's mind. So when we think, oh, why do they get kids and and the random acts? Listen, you are a person timed perfectly, designed specifically by God passionately. The next thing is that God knows, has a plan for each of our lives, knowing our first day and our last. If you've never read Psalm 139, read it. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture because it's clear. He knows our first day and our last. He's got a plan for everything in your life. So you're born at the right place at the right time to the right family in the right circumstance and situation according to his plan. And you say, well, that stinks. Well, guess what? 
That's another thing you're not in control of. Or you may say, "Woo, I'm glad. Some of you may say, I was born in the wrong time period. No, you weren't. It isn't random chance. God doesn't have a, a bucket of babies. He says, okay, let's dump some in here. That's not how it works. God has your timeline laid out. And the last thing is that each, uh, is that both men and women are made in the image of God. Of God. It's in the first chapter of the Bible and it's sprinkled all throughout that we are made unique from the rest of creation, made in God's image, made to share His character, made to be in relationship with God. Every time I do premarital counseling, this is something I try to repeat as many times in Scripture that is in there because I want this married couple to realize that although there are different roles in marriages, Men and women are equal and made in God's image. There is no subordination in God's kingdom. We're equal. And so I want you guys to see that today. That these are the rights that we have because God is specific about every single individual on the earth. So Respect Life Sunday is not just about the unborn. It's about all human life. Every person has equal value in God's sight because he gave his life. He gave us life and he gave his life for each of us and has a purpose and a plan for you. Maybe that's all you need to hear today. Let me tell you that. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. You may have told yourself and others may have told you you're a mistake, you're a failure, you're nothing, you'll never amount to anything. Hogwash! You are made for a purpose and a reason, and God has an amazing plan for your life. And believe it, because it's true. We are all equal in His sight, but it's our choice that determines what our future holds and what kind of relationship with God has for us. Do you want to walk like Enoch? Do you want to be a Jeremiah? Do you want to be a Billy Graham or whoever may be a hero of your faith? Do you want to be a Ruth or Mary? It's not determined by birth who they were going to be. It was their choice as to how deeply they were going to depend on the Savior, Jesus Christ. Who you can be is based on your choice to walk deeply with Him. So this is good news, right? This is good news for all of us, our friends, our family, even the ones that, that you're family with and you kind of wish you were. It's good news for them. But there's some people that we think, oh, it's not such good news. Jonah 1, 1 through 3. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Never try that. You can't. Read Psalm 139. You can't. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Here we have a passage of scripture that many of you have probably heard most of your life, if not all of it of a man, a child of God, a prophet of God named Jonah that God says specifically, this is the plan that I have for you for your life. I want you to go to this specific city and pronounce my judgment on them. Now we're not told why Nineveh is receiving judgment, but the author thought it was obvious because during that time period when Jonah was written, Everybody knew how wicked Nineveh was, okay? So I'm not going to name cities today, but you can think of the cities that if God were going to pronounce his judgment in North America, you say, that city definitely needs it, right? That's what it's like with Nineveh. Everybody knows how wicked and awful it is. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And I want you to, I, I, I don't know if I put, I don't think I put this in your notes, but I want you to, to pencil this in if you can. Because this is a truth that you need to, to embrace. Anywhere there is rampant sin, there will be devalu devaluing of human life. Anywhere where there's rampant sin, there's going to be the devaluing of human life. 
because any sin is always my right to my way no matter what. And so we always will think of ourselves above others when we're being sinful. You can see that in other parts of the scripture. Genesis with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? There's this devaluing of human life happening there. Anywhere where there's rampant sin, life is less valued because we put more value upon ourselves. And the crimes against humanity in the Assyrian Empire were great. I mean, historians record them putting people into slavery, skinning people alive, thousands beheaded, people burned alive. You think of the worst atrocities possible, the Assyrians were guilty of it. They were not a people who valued human life. And you think, how can a person or people group get to that point when sin is rampant, the human life will always be devalued. And so their wickedness increased and so did their cruelty. Now immediately we're not told why Jonah flees from this call. If God were to say to you today, I want you to go to so-and-so's house and pronounce judgment on them, most of us would go, yay! Because we love doing that, right? We love pointing the finger and saying, you got it wrong and you need to fix some things. We do. God, let me have that calling. I'd be glad to do that for you. But Jonah doesn't. He flees. He goes as far away as he can, crosses the Mediterranean Sea and says, I'm going to take a vacation in Spain rather than do what you call me to do. Why? Well, after Jonah repents and God saves him with a great fish. Well, well, before that, we forget. We, we, we gloss over this because of the pretty cartoon pictures that we've read in our children's books. But you've got to remember that what literally happens in this thing is as he's running from God and realizes he can't, he tries to commit suicide. He does. He throws himself overboard, has the sailors help him, but throws himself overboard and it's in the midst of that dying moment that he remembers God and God sends a great fish and it swallows him up. And, and so after God saves him from the fish and, and he pronounces this, this judgment upon Nineveh, if you've ever read Jonah before, he doesn't offer any grace. He doesn't say, if you repent, then God. No, he just says, God's coming and he's going to slam you. Watch out. And in response to, to that unloving message the king of Nineveh the people everyone repents sackcloth and ashes mourning they just this wave of repentance covers the whole city and so Jonah tells God angrily in chapter 4 verses 2 through 4 didn't I say before I left home that you would do this Lord that is why I ran away to Tarshish I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. The Lord replied, Is it right? Hmm, there's that word, huh? Is it right for you to be angry about this? You see, Jonah was a victim. We're not told for certain what happened in Jonah's life, but he was part of the nation of Israel. And Israel was one of the nations under the Assyrian Empire's thumb. Jonah might have possibly lost a wife or, or children or a brother or sister, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, probably whole towns, communities. People that he loved and knew had been victimized, tortured, and killed by the Syrians. I don't know that for a fact, but most likely some of the atrocities that I talked about affected him personally. And he says, no, I'm a victim. They're the perpetrators. They don't deserve your grace. He didn't want to pronounce judgment. He didn't want to go there and tell them anything because he knew the character of his God, that God is gracious and loving and will show mercy. And Jonah said, they don't deserve your grace. The first point this morning that I want you to see is that God values human life more than we do. Let that get deep into your heart. 
God values human life more than we do. You may have questioned that before. God, why are kids put into slavery? Why are they abused? Why, why, are, why is you allowing cruelty to animals? Or why, why do these terrible things happen? These might be the questions that rise up within you. And, and you say, God, you, you don't care as much as I do. You don't love people as much as I do. You don't value human life as much as I do. And the truth of the matter is, when we live as victims, we're not very loving either. God's grace is truly available to all people, even to people that we don't think deserves it. And when you maintain an attitude of being a victim, you can become angry, vicious, hateful, awful people. It's funny. It's ironic how that works. That's why it's a paradox. Those who are victims oftentimes become worse than those who have victimized them because this, this venom, this poison, this hurt rules their life and they start thinking more about themselves. And, and so God, let me just say here, God does not excuse the sins of the Assyrians. The empire is going to suffer the consequence of their actions. But on a cross, centuries later, Jesus was dying even for them. So the second point is the truth of the matter is if any person maintains a victim's mentality, they will elevate the value of their life and devalue the life of others. They will elevate the value of their life and devalue the life of others. And so we see this clearly in Jonah's story. Because of Jonah's victimized mentality. Now, now I'm not saying that you can't be a victim. I think everybody in this room has been victimized in some way, shape, or form by someone or something in your life. You can't avoid victimhood. So don't feel guilty if you become a victim because that's been something that was done to you that you couldn't control. But if you hold on to that victimhood, it will change your heart where you will value your life over other people's lives. And so in Jonah's story, he devalues the life of the Ninevites to the point that he's willingly disobeying God and going away from them. He devalues the life of the sailors by putting himself on their boat, knowing he's rebelling against God. And when God sends the wind and the waves and the storm, he's just trying to hide out and sleep. And they're all struggling for their life. And then he asks them to be accessories to his murder. Throw me overboard. Then he... Va- he gets to the point that he even devalues his own life by committing suicide. When you maintain a victim's mentality, it will take away your love for people. You'll devalue people. Then when he finally gets to Nineveh, he's angry at God's grace. He threatens suicide again, right? It's better that I die than you show grace to these people. How quickly we forget that we are recipients of that same grace. I read that passage and I think, man, Jonah is a spoiled brat. That's me. Did God have to send a fish to save Jonah? God didn't have to send a fish in the first place. Jonah ended up in the bottom of the ocean because of Jonah's choices. God's grace went even beyond his, his original plan for Jonah's life to save him. And I think it's ironic and even funny that he left him in there for three days just to think about it. Sometimes it's good to be in the belly of a fish because you think, wow, this is where I am. This is where the choices of my life have taken me. I don't know if I'll ever get out. But God, I have you. Read his prayer. I think it's in chapter 2. Read his prayer. He never asked God in his prayer to release him. He's thankful in the belly of the fish. It's the most thankful he is in his life. But he quickly forgets how undeserving of God's grace he is 
when he keeps that victim's heart and mentality. God uses one more living example to try to reach Jonah with that destructive behavior he's adopted. Jonah 4, 5 through 11. Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. Oh. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant, so it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah, and the sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, Is it, what's that word again? Right for you to be angry because the plant died. Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Now here's the crux of the problem. Whether it's the pro-life issue, health care, immigration, racism, human trafficking, whatever. When we value ourselves so highly and our rights and our comforts, and we demand God's justice for, for others and his grace for us, we have a real problem. Because we take one side or another. Whose life is more valuable, the babies or the mothers? The immigrant or the citizen? One race or another? The slave or the slave driver? And God says, both! Both are equal in my sight. Both have the same value. I love both the same. And we think, ah, how is that possible? Matthew 7, verse 2. Get your mouth guard in. It's about to kick you in your teeth. Words of Jesus. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Now we think, oh, that wish Adolf Hitler would have heard that. Osama bin Laden or Joseph Stalin or whoever may be the worst of the worst in your mind. Jesus is saying that to us, to you and to me. By what, what standard you judge other people, that's how I'm going to judge you. And so that's the third point. Where you draw the line of grace for others, God draws the line of grace for you. Jonah forgot the undeserved grace that he received and drew a line in the sand and said, they don't deserve this. And God is saying, well, where does that put you, son? When we think too highly of ourselves, our rights and our comforts, we claim we have a right to our health care, a right to our money, our right to our birth control, a right to our bodies, over another person's right simply to exist. This is why this issue is a mountain I'm willing to die on. Because the definition of sin is my right to my way no matter what. And the enemy just laughs at us. I've gotten you to think more highly of yourself than anybody else. I've gotten you to put yourself on a pedestal. I've gotten you to not care about the rights and needs of others, even just to exist because I got you so comfortable. I win. Ha, 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 ha. We are no different than Jonah. And so God says to us, do you have a right to be angry? Do you have a right to be angry? What's well, my comfort? It's the nice leafy branch and that darn worm and wind. And We as Christians don't live to be comfortable here. This world isn't our home. 
our home is being prepared for us in eternity. Oh. So, how should we be as Christians? Our example is Jesus Christ. We have worth because he designed us perfectly. He planned the right place, the right time. We're made in his image. All of those things. And so we need to see how Jesus compares himself to his own rights. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. I've read this passage many times, and every time it just puts me right on the right focus. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God. Now, is anybody higher than God? Anybody close to his elevation if we're going to do a hierarchy here? No. Okay? Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Boom. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. Boom. He took the humble position of a slave. Boom. Was born as a human being. Boom. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Can't get any lower than that, folks. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. Oh. Oh. Jesus could have played the victim card more than anybody else. You're wrongly accusing me. You're beating me and I didn't deserve it. I've never sinned my whole life. Why are you putting me on a cross? Why are my followers abandoning me? What? This isn't fair. This isn't right. He led, led as a lamb to the slaughter quietly. Because he gladly laid down his life to show you and me that he values all life equally. The Ninevites, the Nazis, the communists, the rapists, the pedophiles, the barbarians, equally. We devalue life when we measure people's worth by their skin tone. Racism is not in Scripture. All made equally in God's sight. Nationality. I've been listening to this audiobook on, on World War II. It grieves my heart what happened during that time period based on nationality, one nation over another, before and during and after, and, and even just hearing recently the atrocities the Russians did to the German people afterward because they thought that they deserved to make them pay as they had paid. None of those things changes God's love or value for a single person on the face of the earth. He desires and chooses everyone equally. The difference between those who end up in a relationship with Jesus for eternity and those that spend an eternity in hell separated from God are those who make the choice not to value Jesus as much as he values them. It's never a question of God's love. He values every person enough to say, in spite of the choices you're going to make, in spite of the situations you put yourself in, in spite of everything, I will die for you. It's your choice. It's my choice. It's on us. It's already done. And brothers and sisters, when we fail to value, value the lives of anyone, whether the unborn or those in the late stages of life, the mass murder, the rapist, the list goes on. If we fail to love them as God loves them, we are in danger of the fires of hell. Because not, we're not reflecting our Savior's heart and life. We're saying, enough grace, enough grace for them, enough grace for them. And God's saying, then you're making a line for yourself. My grace knows no bounds. And you know, you might say, but they deserve. You have no idea. No one has any idea what they did to me. The physical abuse, the emotional abuse. I've had to bear this burden the rest of my life. I have consequences for an action I never chose. They need to pay. And Jesus says, yes, they do. They do need to pay. And I paid it. I took on the worst for them. And you. 
It's not their place to pay anymore. I've paid it. So let it go. Be free. Live the fullness of life I have for you. Human value cannot be changed by our choices, circumstances, or situation because God is the one who defines our value. God is the one who defines our value. Well, you don't know. So, hey, let me tell you about that guy over there. And we go, hmm, yeah, he's a bad person or she's awful. You know that there are times you don't want to be seen with certain individuals out in public because of the label they have. You know what those limits are for you, who you're willing to love, who you're willing to be around. And Jesus says, I am there. I love every person equally. I know for me, I've come to a place where I'm thankful for cancer. I know that's weird sounding, but if my wife hadn't gotten ovarian cancer, I don't think I'd have three of my children. We were willing to adopt Hannah. We were starting to adopt her before we got diagnosed with cancer, but after we were unable to have any more children on our own, God expanded our heart to be willing to adopt more. And I'll just be honest with you, our initial reactions to these parents, that I, I was thankful that they gave their children life and now they're living in my home, but my initial thoughts were anger toward them. How dare they hurt and abuse my children? How dare they treat them this way? How dare they have to suffer through these things in life? But they're in my home. And they're my children now. And they're part of my family. And the cross defines their future, not their victimized past. And their, their parents, I hurt for them. I love them. I want them to have the fullness of Jesus Christ. Because they are victims too. Because they are, have been lied to. And, and, and cheated and stolen and the enemy has control of them and they're in deep darkness and I want nothing more than salvation for them. God can only do that, folks. So God does not value the life of the mother or father over the precious baby that's aborted, but he doesn't love the parents any less. At this point, I have to add, because we can often get de derailed here, God's grace is not cheap. Even at Nineveh, he said, repent. Repent. I've paid the price, but you have to repent. That's still part of it. Scripture says, yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Christians cannot continue to play the victim. All of us have been hurt or, or wounded, abused, neglected. And we can recognize how those things have changed us. But as Christians, we cannot remain there. We cannot continue to play the victim because we will not value life as Jesus does. So the fourth point this morning is, as Christians, we recognize that Jesus bore the pain of our victimhood so that we can love everyone as he does and value all life everywhere equally. I want to close today, and I want to ask you to reflect upon those who have harmed you and let it go. I want you instead to think about you and the undeserved grace and love that you've received, and I want you to have a thankful heart today. This is who I was, Jesus. This is who I could be if I didn't have you in my life. Thank you. And as you reflect and receive his love and grace anew, he'll change you and enable you to love those that you have, un have deemed unworthy of God's grace. Pray that God will change your heart. Some of you may have a list of the worst of the worst that you just struggle with. It might be an abortion doctor or, or, or a human trafficker. God will reach those as well. And to answer God's question to Jonah, no. We have no right to be angry. We have no right. The right that we have that God gives us is the right to live. And from that, he asks us 
to lay down all other rights to him. Because he's got us, guys. Our future, our hope is secure in him. We have him, we have everything. But my right, no, that's sin. We lay down our rights so that others can experience God's love and be changed and transformed. Let that be the defining principle of your life. Let's pray. Lord, I do lift up those in the room today who have struggled with victimhood. I don't think it's an extreme statement to say that all of us have been victims in one way, shape, or form. And, and there's part of us that think the perpetrators need to pay and suffer. Maybe some people feel that about us. And God, your grace was extended to everyone equally. We're made equally. We're designed equally. We're all made in your image. And your love and grace is equally given. So Lord, change our hearts. Let us release the victimhood and the consequences of our life to you and realize that you bore our shame upon the cross. That we don't have to carry that burden anymore. And we don't have to ensure that that person receives judgment because you've already paid their penalty. Let us show love and grace. Give us a love for people of all races. Give us a love, Lord God, for the, for the uh, husband and wife that have made the choice to abort their children. Help us to see the wounds that they have and to love them as you love them. Lord, help us to love the, the ones that we really think are the worst of the worst, the pedophile or, or, or the rapist or whatever, God, whatever might be our limit that we think, I just cannot love them. God, you do. And we don't get it until we stop and look at ourselves and remember the grace that we've received in spite of our sin. Help us to acknowledge when we're thinking too highly of ourselves and remember that you, Jesus, made yourself nothing. I want to know you, Lord, and I want to look like you. I am the first to admit that my love is imperfect. I have limits. So God, help me to value life as I should. In many ways, it's easy to stand up for the rights of the unborn because it's obvious to some of us that that's a, a hill worth dying on. But some of us would be struggling to lay down our lives for someone who's rightfully in prison for the rest of their life. Change our hearts. Help us to see the world through your eyes. In your name we pray. Amen.